Good morning, everybody. Is it time to start? I think it's 10.30. OK. So good morning. My name is Matthias. I'm the CTO of 28 milliseconds. And today, I'm going to show you how you can do more with uh, MongoDB and JSONic. To give you a little introduction about what we're going to do, so the, the world is full of data. And this data lives in a huge variety of data stores. In those data stores, it lives in a huge variety of data sources, uh, data formats. Those data formats are either completely relational tables, completely structured, JSON documents, which are hierarchical, flexible, uh, XML, which is a semi-structured format, or completely down to unstructured text. For all of this, this data to be valuable, a lot of processing needs to happen to turn it into actionable information. For example, the data needs to be filtered, it needs to be aggregated, needs to be correlated, needs to be cleaned. And people are doing this today, but they are either cluing and stitching together solutions around a technology that was developed in 1978, which is called SQL, or they are using all those great NoSQL data stores that are out there that mostly only offer very low-level primitives, very low-level operations of things that you can do with the data. And at 28 milliseconds, we believe that it's time for NoSQL to take this to the next level of what we call information processing. In the heart of our solution, of our technology, is a language called JSONic. Like SQL, JSONic is a high-level declarative language, query language, that allows you to process data. However, it delivers to you a set of capabilities that allow you to do far more with far more data types in much less time, much less code, and much more productive. In the remainder of this talk, I'm not going to use any slides anymore. I just want to show you a live demo and develop together with you a set of queries, JSONic queries, that show you the capabilities of the language to give you an impression, imagination of what you can do with this and how powerful it is. So let's see if the internet works. So here's, the, here's an in-browser development environment that we have at 28 milliseconds. In this case, this project that we see here is connected to a MongoDB database. This MongoDB database contains a set of collections that you see here. And I hope that the font size is big enough. If not, you might want to come to the front a little bit more. And those collections um, model, or the, the two topmost collections here model a subset or contain a subset of the Stack Overflow data set, answers and FAQs. The data is stored in Mongo. So as you, you, you can imagine, it's, it's JSON data. You can take a look at it here. That's one of the answers that is stored. An answer contains a question ID, contains an answer ID, a last activity date, and also it contains nested the information about the owner who posted that answer. And the owner has a display name or a reputation, for example, along with some other metadata. The other collection is the actual questions that were answered. A question also has a question ID. That is the correlation between answers and questions. It has a score, an answer count, a title, tags in an array. And it also contains the owner information nested here. Okay, So that's just a very brief introduction about the, the data that, that we are going to use for this, for this demo. And you don't need to understand all of, the, no, all of the details. So now I have a problem because the font is too big. So the first thing I want to do is I want to analyze some of the questions that are in the MongoDB collection. For this, I'm going to go through all of the questions in the FAQ collection. I'm going to select only the questions that have the is answered field and the value of the is answered field is true. I'm going to order them by their last edit date because that's what I'm interested in. And I'm going to return for each of the questions, in this case, only the questions title and the last edit date. 
So that's the most simplest JSON query that you can have. What you see here is you see the title and the last edit date. And the last edit date here contains a lot of uh, null values because the last edit field in, is not available in all of the questions. A couple of uh, interesting things about those, this query is you can extract fields from a JSON document and you can navigate also deep down in the hierarchy of a JSON document. You can construct new JSON objects that have values that might exist in your data or might be computed. And um, the, the, in, the most important thing here is that you can see that compared to SQL, where the input to a SQL query is a table and the output is a table, the input to a JSONic query can be a JSON document and the output can be a JSON document. And the input and the output can actually be much more, but we're going to this later. So the next thing is, uh, that I'm going to do is I don't like those null values here being at, being at the beginning of, of my result. So what I'm going to show you is that I can com arbitrarily nest expressions wherever a value can occur. So I'm going to say if there is a last edit date, I'm going to return that last edit date. Otherwise, I'm going to return zero because I want them to be at the end. So now I can run the query. And yes, you see, the null values are now at the end of the query result. Okay, So that's a very important observation that you can arbitrarily nest expressions here. Okay. Any questions regarding this query? Yes, please. No, the return value can be a JSON object. It can be any atomic type that you want. It could be XML, I'm going to get to that later. Uh, it can be uh, new line separated strings for uh, CSV or whatever you want. In this case, I'm just constructing JSON objects. Yes, please. Yes, so that's a very good question. So the, the language has a notion to distinguish between the absence of a value, whether the value is null, or whether the, the value can be converted to a Boolean. So for example, you could use a, a function called exists here that tells you uh, whether the value exists or not. So I could do where exists this field. And I can also check whether uh, the field is uh, null with the function here. Does that make sense? So you can distinguish between all those three cases. And that's an important thing in, uh, in JSON that you need to do because JSON distinguishes between the absence of a value and whether the value is null. Yes, please. Absolutely, absolutely. It's good. I'm going to have examples for that later. It's completely compositional language. So, as I said, the language is uh, declarative. It's a functional language. And declarative here means that, like SQL, it's highly optimizable. So just by looking at the, the query, a query optimizer can optimize it according to the, the features that are available in the underlying data store. In this case, for example, if the MongoDB database or the collection had an index on is answered, then the execution of this query could leverage that index. The same for if it has an, had an index on the last edit date that is ordered, then you don't need to manually order the, the results here. And another thing that, that um, what you can do with those queries is you can automatically parallelize the execution of such a query across multiple processes or clusters. Because you can see that the execution of each iteration of the for loop, in this case, can happen independently, except the order, of course which you need to do at the end, okay? So that would be the, the basic concepts of a JSONic query in the most simplest JSONic query that you can have. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit more complicated query. What I want to do is I want to go through all of the answers in the collection answers. And those answers I would like to group by the owner's display name. So what I can do is I can say group by name, where the name is within the owner, owner's display name. So here I can navigate across two levels in the hierarchy of the JSON document. 
and the display name is going to be a string, so it's going to group them according to the equality of the strings. Then within each group, what I would like to do for each of the owners, I would like to compute the average reputation over all the answers that one of the users has posted. So what I can do is I can use floor and the average functions that are built in into JSONic, and I can get the reputation out of, a, out of the answers. So what this one is doing is after the grouping here, answers is going to be a sequence, a group. And I can, for all of the answers here, extract the re reputation. So this is going to be a sequence as well. And average is going to compute the average over that sequence. Then the next thing that I would like to do is I would like to obviously order by the average reputation descending because I'm interested in the most reputated ones. However, the, as we already, already discussed earlier, the reputation field might not be available in all of the JSON documents. So what the average and the floor function in this case are going to do is they are going to return me the empty sequence. And in the order by clause, I can determine whether I want to have the empty sequence at the beginning or at the front. That's like whether you want to treat null in your order by uh, at the beginning or at the front. So I'm going to say empty least. And I'm going to return a JSON object that contains the name, which is uh, per group always uh, only one. And then I'm going to return the average reputation that I computed. So now you can see that the average reputation of this guy is this number. Okay. Now, that itself might not be sufficient, and I want to get some more, some more values out of this, out of this query at the, in, in one run. So what I'm, what I'm also interested in is I'm also interested in the questions, the top questions that this guy answered. So what I'm going to do is I'm using the subsequence function, and I'm going to have a nested query here where I go through all the answers. I order them by their score descending, and I'm returning the question ID for all of the answers. And I'm only interested in the top three, so I'm going to pass one and three as parameters to the subsequence function here. Okay. So now if I run this query, what I get is I get the same information and another field that says questions. And those are the IDs of the questions that this guy answered and he got the highest score. Does that make sense? So this answers, uh, I think, your question that you can arbitrarily nest expressions in the return clause or in the computation of a value of a JSON field. So now you might realize that the question ID maybe doesn't tell you a lot. So what you might want to do is you want to get the, the titles of those questions actually out of the database. But for this, I'm first going to make the query a little simpler. And I'm going to introduce a function that is called top answered questions. It takes as parameters some answers. And in the body of the function, I'm just going to literally copy and paste what was in there. So now I took this expression, put it in the body of a function, and here I'm just going to invoke the top answered questions function, giving the answers as parameter. Okay. Going to run it. And what we're going to give, get is the exact same result as we had before. So that's another interesting observation here. What we can do is we can start to, since it's a functional language, we can take any arbitrary expression, put it in a function, and invoke it later. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those questions, those question IDs, and I want to get the titles of the questions. So far, we only looked at the answers collection. The titles of the questions, however, are stored in the FAQ collection. So what we need to do is we need to make a join between the answers and the FAQ collection. 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to iterate over all of the IDs, all of the question IDs here. And I'm going to return for each of them from the FAQ collection the corresponding question whose question ID is equal to the question ID of the answer. So here, this is an implicit loop over the collection FAQ. It's returning me the entire FAQ collection for each of them. And that's just a shortcut for another flower with a where. The dollar dollar in each iteration refers to the question that, that is currently being iterated over. I'm extracting the question ID and I'm comparing it with the question ID that is coming from my top answered questions. And then I'm going to have a question here and I'm going to extract the title. I'm going to run this. And as you will see, if the internet is not broken, okay, took some time. As you can see here, now in the questions array, I ha I'm having the titles of the FAQ of the questions corresponding to the top, answered, to the top answers. And uh, there are some duplicates in here. So what I could do is I could add another function here that says, uh, give me only the distinct values before I compute a subsequence in order to avoid the duplicates here. So, yes, please. Is it possible to get a row column JSON So what you get in the result here already is you get a sequence of JSON objects. And those could be considered as rows, right? So you could. So... There's no notion of a column here, but what you could do is you could make for a construct, for example, a CSV a file here and say that what you want is you want a name concatenated using a comma, concatenated using the average reputation, and then uh, continue here. So I can delete that and, and execute it, but. Uh, Maybe you want to keep this on the screen if you have more questions regarding this. So what I wanted to say is that the, the title of the talk is do more with MongoDB and JSONic. And so all the, uh, the queries that you've seen so far, you could uh, potentially also write with uh, MongoDB's query language, or for example, in this case, particularly with the aggregation framework. But here is, uh, we first introduced a new concept that Mongo cannot do, which is a join between two collections. And now you might argue that the, a join cannot be done efficiently with, uh, within Mongo. And that's a, a very valid uh, question. But on the other hand, um, you, I think we need to realize that what people are doing today is they are already doing joins, but they are doing them in the host language. So people need to get this information out of their Mongo database. And so what, e what everybody does and or what every, each NoSQL developer does is he's writing a 400 line Python program to get this kind of information out of their Mongo database. And here you are having a, a query that is 20 lines. It's declarative, it's very high level, and um, it's maintainable. And you would usually argue that the viewer lines of code you have, the viewer box you have, so I think this has a lot of advantages. Now the next thing you argue is how can this be executed efficiently? Well, the, the answer is the same. Today each NoSQL developer has to come up with his own efficient join algorithm to make sure that this query is executed most efficiently. In, in JSONic, we have an, or our implementation of JSONic has an optimizer that tries to choose the most efficient execution plan to execute that query. And again, if the Mongo database in this case had an index on question ID, then this join here could be turned into something that is called an hash join or an index-based hash join uh, in order to guarantee that the query is executed most efficiently. Does that make sense? Okay. So those are the the most basic JSONic queries 
that that you can come up with. And we have a lot more queries that are much, much bigger and much more complicated and get much more useful information out of the database. But what we really want to look at is that we can do even much more with JSONic than what I've showed you. And at the beginning of the talk, I said that today's data is living in a, in a huge variety of, of data sources and in a huge variety of data formats. So what you really want to do is you want to write queries or JSONic programs that process the data across those sources. So in this query, what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm doing a join between the answers collection that we have in Mongo and a SQL table that now contains the questions. So what I'm doing here is I'm going through all the answers. I'm grouping them by their question ID. I'm computing the maximum score um, within the group. I'm ordering them by the maximum score descending. Then I'm going to select only the ones that have a very high score. And then what I want to do is I want to correlate that information, those answers, with the titles from the SQL database. So JSONic is a very extensible language, and we extended it with uh, plenty of modules that provide functions that allow you to do a lot of stuff. In this case, we, we did a, a JDBC connector module that allows you to execute queries against your relational database. So what I'm doing here is I'm executing a SQL query, select star from FAQ on a connection, and I specified the information for, for the connection up here. So in this case, it's a MySQL database running on Amazon RDS. Executing this query, the result comes back. In this case, it comes back each row as a JSON object, as a flat JSON object. And I'm doing a join between the question ID coming from the relational database and the ID of the question for this group. In this case, I can run it. And boom, here it is. So what we did is we joined data between MongoDB and our relational database. And including the four lines of connection information that I have here and a module import for the JDBC module, this query has 19 lines of code. So now I'll try to, to imagine how, much, how many lines of code it would take you if you develop this query or this kind of, of functionality in Python or Ruby or Java. Okay. Any other questions regarding this? Oh, yeah, that's a very good question. So the, the language itself is uh, purely functional and declarative. And a functional declarative language usually doesn't have any side effects. So it doesn't make any updates to the outside world of the query. And this is an important property that declarative languages have, such that you can heavily optimize the execution of the query. Now, in this case, there a, is a bug that leads to that. There, there are functions that are marked as having side effects. And in this case, the connect function was marked uh, by, by mistake as having a side effect. And so what this, this IDE does, it, it warns you before you execute the query, because if you just execute it multiple times or the UI executes it automatically, you might make changes to, to some other database. So it's just an additional level of uh, security that the IDE gives you here. Yes, please. Uh, if your query did have insert statements, those would be side effects. Those would be side effects. It would, you would get the same warning. You can run it. It would make those updates. But if you run it again, you better be sure that that's what you want to do. There was another question over here. Absolutely. So there are several answers to this question. The first is um, I already showed you the concept of a function. So what you can do is you can start building your own modules containing functions of functionality that you have. I can take this entire query here and just put it in a function and make it available for others. And the, 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 the second answer to this question would be each of the queries in, in our product, at least, is exposed using a REST API. So you can invoke the, a resource that triggers the execution of the query. You get a result back. And then what you could do is you could pipe this result in, 
to the execution of another query. But that would be another level of indirection. OK. So last example that I'm going to show you here. So here I have a, a query that at the beginning imports two modules. I'm going to show you what they're used for. One is an HTTP module, and one is an archive module. What I'm going to do in this query is I, I have a resource here. It's a zip file that the US Trademark Office publishes every day. And what it contains is it contains all the information about the trademarks that were modified or added the previous day. And the contents, contents of this zip file is an XML, is an X, in the XML format. In this case, it's probably, uh, I think, a 200 megabyte XML file. And what we want to do is we want to take this information, process the XML data in it, and uh, extract some of the data, transforming it into JSON, because that's what our web application in this case uh, can consume easier. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what it's going to do. So what, what, how it works is I'm having this URL here. I'm binding the value to, to a variable. Then I'm using the HTTP module to retrieve the binary value behind this URL. Next, I'm going to use the archive module. I'm going to use the extract text function of the archive module to extract the zip file in order to get to the raw XML text. And then I'm having a function parse XML that takes the XML text and transforms it into the data model that JSONic uses. At the end, I'm using the XPath notation to walk through all the case file elements within this XML document that I retrieved. And for each of the cases, I'm constructing a new JSON object, the fields being the serial number of the trademark cast as an integer, the name, the mark identification of the trademark, and uh, the owner information. And since there might be multiple owners, I'm going to put them in an array here. And so here you can see the result. It's the serial number, the name of the trademark, and the owner. So now going back to what this query does is it takes some XML data on the web, parses it, transforms each of, processes it, and transforms each of, each of the case file elements into JSON. And now imagine what you could do with the if you merge that with the, the query that we had in the, in the other example is in the, mean, uh, in, in the middle of the query, I could also connect to a relational database in order to join the information that I'm retrieving from the web, the information that I retrieve from my relational database, and the information that I retrieve from my Mongo database. And I'm going to join or correlate all of that and return it as, in the, as the result of a query. Does that make sense? OK, so as I said, that was the last example here. So to, to recap what, what we did is I, I showed you a powerful and very productive query language for NoSQL. I showed you plenty of examples on top of MongoDB to begin with. And then I started to develop examples that join federated data sources, those data sources each storing data in various formats. And uh, I hope I could give you a feeling of, of JSONic, how it works, and how productive it is to do exactly those things. Now, JSONic is an open specification. It's uh, developed by, we are the main contributor to the language, but uh, Oracle, EMC also contributed. It has been implemented uh, by several open source uh, processors. And also IBM recently announced support for JSONic in their WebSphere line of products. Um, we have a free book at our booth about the language. I have some of them here. You can just come pick them up. It um, is a basic introduction into JSONic. And it contains a lot of examples that you can just copy paste into, into the, the console that, that was here. And there are even more examples, and, and obviously the, the product of, of my company, available at 28.io. So, are there any other questions? Yes, please.
Absolutely, that's what we believe as well. Now there's some controversy uh, in this, and I guess we, the two of us and some other folks are going to have a, a panel in the afternoon that is discussing the standardization of query languages in a NoSQL space. Uh, I'm on your side here, but I've heard that there are people that have different opinion, and I hope we can discuss them today at the, at the panel. Yes, please. Distributed? Yeah. As I mentioned at the beginning, the, the language is declarative, which means it's highly optimizable. So what it, specifically what you can do is you can paralyze the execution of a query. So for example, what, what we do is if your Mongo database is sharded, then we leverage that fact, extract the shards, or more specifically the chunks out of those shards, and run several processes of the same query and send it to each of the shards or execute it only on a portion of the data and later aggregate it. So that means you can, you can scale, highly scale the execution of those queries. And in some of the benchmarks that we did, comparing it to, to Hadoop systems, for example, it shows that at least our implementation is in the same ballpark than Hadoop if you start to parallelize the execution of such queries. So some other questions? Yes, please. Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah, maybe I didn't make this clear. So all those queries were run on servers that we host in the Amazon cloud. And on those servers, we only run the execution of the query. We only have a, a query virtual machine. And when you run this query, we, do, we connect to other data sources. In this case, one of the data sources was a MongoDB database hosted by MongoHQ in the Amazon cloud as well. And the other one was a MySQL database hosted by Amazon's uh, RDS service. So they, they were completely federated. Now, obviously, you, you want to make sure that the latency between the query processor, between the, the servers that you run the JSON queries on, and the data is, is low in order to get a very good performance. So the time is up, but I'm happy to take more questions because there's a longer break now. So. Yes, please. On Hadoop, um, so theoretically, you could implement, for example, a, a module that allows you to um, retrieve data from the HDFS file system, for example, and then you could process the data within within HDFS, uh, and you could parallelize the execution of that data. Now, that doesn't have to do anything with, with MapReduce on HDFS. But what you could also do is, but that's nothing that we do, is we, you could take the language, the JSONic language, and translate it into a MapReduce job. Theoretically, that, that, should, that should be possible, and I don't think it's very hard. And then this would only be a syntax that allows you to create MapReduce job then that are then executed by Hadoop, because Hadoop is a very good and scalable runtime. Yes, please. How much work is it to add another data source? Another data source? Uh, that depends. So we have a lot of connectors to data sources. A lot of the vendors are being exhibited, uh, exhibitors here. We have a connector to Oracle NoSQL, to Cloudend. But those are really only lightweight connectors that uh, use the primitives of, that those data stores provide. Our integration with MongoDB is much deeper. So it also detects indexes. It pushes down the projection to not retrieve all the information, all this kind of stuff. And it really depends. A lightweight connector you can build in one day. How it, much code is like the MongoDB? The MongoDB connector? That's a very good question. So there are several things that you need to take the BSIN, transform it into our data model. So that's a couple of thousand lines of code, the deep integration. Because it also targets then the optimizer who needs to detect the indexes in Mongo and then rewrite the query to leverage that index. So the deep integration is a bit more work. But a lightweight connector is... Uh, Relatively simple. Um, no, the, the core, the query processor is entirely written in C++. And um, we do have the JDBC connector, for example, obviously is in, in, in Java. And we call the JDBC connector, in this case, using JNI. But there are several language bindings that you can use also to extend uh, with functionality uh, the, the language. So 90% of, of what I've showed you is open source. It's, uh, 
in the core is the Zoba processor, the Zoba NoSQL processor, which is uh, licensed under the Apache 2 license. And then some of the, the connectors that I've shown you have been developed by, by my company. They are not open source yet, and we are, we are deciding whether we are going to do that. And we are trying to push more and more into open source as we go. Any other questions? Yes, please. No, not yet. There's no syntax yet for tra uh, traversing graphs. But if you look at the graph query languages that are out there, I think the syntax can be very well integrated into JSONic in order to allow also to give you that kind of functionality. So instead of doing, doing the navigation in a JSON document, you could have a syntax that allows you to do the, the traversal in, in the graph. So I think an extension to JSONic is indeed possible to, to extend that to graph functionality. Yes, the language specification. Whether we are going to implement that or not, uh, I don't know. Any more questions? Yes, please. All right, so I have some books here. Feel free to pick them up. Thank you very much.